Well, good evening. I want to thank you for joining another episode of The Fireplace Show. The Fireplace Show is sponsored by CVC Success Group. And the purpose of The Fireplace Show is for the chimney, the venting, the hearth industry to share with you things that will help you as a consumer to understand about your fireplace, about your chimney, about gas logs, wood stoves, and other things. Each and every week and every episode, I try to bring on a subject matter expert to help me help explain to the listeners what there is with chimneys and what they need to be looking for. And tonight, our guest is a gentleman by the name of Stephen Scaley. I've known Stephen for many, many years, and we go back a long way. Very good friend of mine. We're actually in two different parts of the country because Stephen hails from the state of New Hampshire. And he also serves a lot of volunteer capacities we'll talk about as we go into this. So here's what I want you to do. Hang on tight. We're going to be right back, and I will have Stephen on the broadcast with me whenever we come back. So stick around. So, good evening, Stephen. Glad you could join us here on the Fireplace Show this evening, sir. How are you doing today, brother? I'm doing very well, Jerry, and thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Well, I know you've got a lot of value, and we're going to sh plan on sharing that out with our audience tonight, Stephen. So, let's start out. I've known you for a lot of years, Stephen. <laughs> so, let's tell the folks a little bit about your background and what qualifies you as what I call a subject matter expert. Okay, so I'll start back in the beginning. I started cleaning chimneys for my Aunt Leslie. Uh, they owned the Chimney Doctor of Concord in uh, Massachusetts, and they started a business back in 1978. Now I was 16 years old. I wanted a car, and I started working for my uncle and my Aunt Leslie, and we started, you know, cleaning chimneys back in the day. They answered that ad from, you know, the, um, the magazine to say, hey, you know, you can make a few extra dollars cleaning chimneys, and off we went. And I've been, you know, cleaning chimneys pretty much ever since then. During my time with uh, Les and Bill, you know, I learned how to reline chimneys. I learned how to do a lot of masonry. I ended up being an expert in the Rumford fireplaces, which are old fireplaces. And I've learned how to do a lot of different things over the years. So what ended up happening is over the years, um, my Aunt Leslie got a divorce from Bill, and then she turned around and she married another gentleman. And at that particular time, I decided it was kind of time for me to, to move on and to start my own thing. Um, my wife and I said, you know what, I think we need to start our own business. We moved up here from New, up to New Hampshire from Malden, Massachusetts in 1999, I mean 1995. We started our business in 1999. The same... 17 days after my daughter was born, our doors opened and we started Fireside Sweeps. And we, you know, and we've been off and running ever since. Well, there's one of our good friends, Dave Levitz, tuned in to us tonight. He's up in your neck of the woods. Now, here's the thing, Stephen, you know, so folks will know Concord, Massachusetts is spelled just like Concord, North Carolina. And the way you and I got to know each other is... Leslie's business was named the Chimney Doctor in Concord, Massachusetts, and I had the Chimney Doctor in Concord, North Carolina. And a lot of times we used to get each other's uh, materials from the suppliers, and that's how I got to know your aunt Leslie some years ago. So you know, and, you know. So anyway, folks. So you know, those folks up north, they just don't know how to properly pronounce words sometimes. So us southern, <laughs> we have to correct them sometimes. So Stephen. Let's, let's go a little bit deeper. Since you, in the last few years, you've come on and you've assumed a lot of positions within the industry. One of them that's most is a very impressive with me is, I believe you're chairman of the technical committee of the National Chimney Sweep Guild, which is a position I used to sit in some years ago. And from that position, you help a lot of sweeps that would call in with technical questions from the field. Am I correct? That is correct. I have... Uh gotten calls from in the field uh, from as far as Hawaii. I've gotten them in Alaska, California, Oregon, Texas, all over the country. So I, I receive a lot of uh, technical calls, mainly for the masonry, which is the part that I um, that I answer. There's many of us who do answer a lot of different calls from across the country uh, for different var uh, varieties of chimney parts, like you know, prefabricated fireplaces is one and things like that. 
Well, that, that's, that's just one of the hats that I that I wear for for the guild. It's it's a voluntary position. I'm on the education committee. Um, I'm on the ethics committee. Um, let's see what else. There's more than that. I'm on the governance committee. I'm also the president of the Northeast Association of Chimney and Hearth Professionals, and all of these are volunteer things. And one of the biggest things that I found, you know, because I always wanted to be on the board of, uh, of the National Chimney Sweep Guild because I felt it as a high honor, and I wanted to give back to all this knowledge that I've incurred over the last 43 years now that I have. And I want to give back to all my fellow fellow sweeps out there to help them, you know, grow and get better and grow faster and, and learn more and, and learn all the different parts about the business, mainly the chimney parts. So, now also, Stephen, you know, this past week, the National Chimney Sweep Guild has been putting on their convention virtually this year, which had to be done because of the pandemic, the COVID issues and everything else. Yeah. But this week, I know I've seen you teach two separate seminars this week. What were the subject matters of the seminars? Because folks, this is kind of what says, when they're a subject matter expert, when you're asked to speak to other members of the industry, something I've done for a number of years. And Stephen, what did you speak on at the uh, virtual convention this week in those two sessions? The, the first session was about chimney inspections and it's A to Z chimney inspections. The, it's the industry standard and has been that way that we inspect chimneys uh, since 2000, uh, I believe it's 2000 when it came up in the NFPA 211. Um, and it's near and dear to my heart because there's so many different things that we can look at inside of a chimney, okay, that we, we need to know what we're looking at when we're in there. So I was trying to go ahead and teach everybody on how to go ahead and, and get an inspection process, you know, no matter what, how they do it, but get a process that works. They, they look at all the different variables inside of the chimneys, you know, so that way they, they can best take care of the homeowner and, and educate the homeowner on what's going on inside the chimney. Because this is very, very important to me um, because there's so many different reports that I've seen from across the country that really haven't gotten things up to snuff. So I felt it my, my duty to teach this class to help get it. And I, I know there's other people who teach it and they do great jobs. I just wanted to come at it from a different angle to try to make it as simple as possible and offer them my checklist and say, here's my checklist. If you follow this, you'll you'll be able to inspect the chimney inside and out, and, and here it goes. Uh, the other one that I talked about was learning your numbers. Um, and in, in the chimney industry, we're really good at like going out and cleaning chimneys, fixing chimneys. The hardest part for most of us in the industry when we start this is learning the business side of it. And I had a hard time with it too. So I wanted to relay that upon other people and how not to fall in those pitfalls. So they learned how to, you know, get those numbers they need to be able to stay in business. And that's yep. why I did it. And Stephen, I'm very proud of you. you know, as, as you know, I taught a pile of classes uh, over my history of my career. I remember seeing your smiling face in a lot of classes at different times as I traveled around the country in my teaching career. So I congratulate you because that's one of the great things about this industry. And I think you'll agree is it's a very sharing industry that people are willing to share their methods, their processes and their procedures with other people. Would you agree with that assessment? Absolutely agree. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen another industry so willing to share their knowledge to other sweeps to help. I've never, you know, not in anything. Yeah. So let's get down to the meat of why we're on the air tonight, what we're broadcasting. And the way I promoted this, this is why chimney maintenance is a part of making your chimney healthy and happy. And when you hear those words, a lot of people might not, might not understand the health implications of a, a chimney that's not performing well. But if a chimney is not performing well, we could well be getting carbon monoxide, other pollutants into the home. So Stephen, let's start out with this. Whenever you're inspecting a chimney, and we're going to say that this is a consumer that's not called you with a the problem. They're just saying, hey, Stephen, I just want you to clean my chimney and get it ready for Santa Claus this fall. So what all do you look for as a chimney technician inspector when you go to a customer's house? And let's just say they've got an open fireplace there. What are you looking for? What I'm looking for of any signs of deterioration, uh, any stains that are going on, um, I usually start with my inspections on the inside. I want to get, get an overall look at it. I'm looking for any cracks. Um, I'm looking to see if we have proper fire brick inside. I'm looking to see if we have proper openings and proper hearth extensions, you know, um, depths, 
proper depths for fireplaces, making sure the damper opens and closes, and making sure that the firebox is attached to the fascia wall. But sometimes when you go in there, they have this really nice uh, front, you know, stone on there, but the, the, it's not tied to the fascia wall. And up inside of there, you know, is wood framing, you know, 12 inches up from that fascia wall. So, I mean, so it's kind of important that we, they, we really inspect those areas. So we look at those, those areas. Once we get, get done with the, the basic looking at, that, then we go a little bit further. And we look up inside. We open up the damper, make sure it opens and closes. We look down the ash dump if there is one to see if there's any wood or leftover uh, wood that's left down inside of there. Because it's a very common problem, especially here in the Northeast. I want to see I get about 70% of my fireplace inspections have wood underneath the firebox. You know, and, that, and that's a very big problem up here. Right. So, Stephen, let's concentrate on that one right there, because that is a big issue in the what we call the mid-Atlantic states. Mid-Atlantic states start in Maryland and go north. So it's that northeastern quadrant. For some reason, brick masons love to build fireplaces and chimneys with wood right under the fire brick, actually holding the fire brick up. So let's tell folks, what's the problem with that if they have this wood? Because, Stephen, brick don't burn. So why is this a problem, sir? <laughs> Very good question, Jerry. Um, basically, what happens when you have a firebox, okay, and you have one, two, or 12 inches thick, the heat transfers down on it because your fire is actually burning at about 1,100 degrees in that firebox if you're getting proper combustion in your fireplace. So that heat is transferring down over periods of time, and that wood that's underneath there is slowly uh, changing its molecular structure, basically. It's starting to uh, cause paralysis down inside, which can cause you know spontaneous combustion inside that area because it's always got a little bit of air from the clean up door below it. So there's always a little bit of air involved. And with the heat transfer that's going that's going down inside the firebox over a period of time, it's going to lessen the flash point of that wood, thus paralysis, and it'll start to charcoal, and then it'll ignite, causing a house fire or a possible house fire that can happen in there. Right. So you're saying the term pyrolysis is how we were, is how we say it. We're also calling that now vaporization. But what's yeah. happening here is. We're driving the moisture out of the wood that's been into it, and the wood's going through a chemical change. And the way I've taught this for years, when wood's brand new, it, it may take 650, 700 degrees for that wood to ignite. But each and every time it's heated up, the, temp the ignition temperature lowers drastically in testing. Now we're seeing as low as 178 degrees. So it's a yeah. big problem. So how often do you encounter this problem in the field with wood under that fireplace floor like that, Stephen? How common is it? It's about 70% of my inspections, I want to say, somewhere in that framework. And when we go in and do these inspections, you know, we don't just go there. We do our complete inspection. We want to look to see if there's one underneath the hearth extension. The hearth extension is the area in front of the firebox, okay, that, you know, that you look into. It's usually 16 or 20 inches deep, depending on the size of the firebox. But we're also looking for it underneath there because that's not supposed to be there either. Because what can happen with that and tends to happen is you'll get a settlement somewhere in the house and you'll get a crack along that facial the, the, right where the facial wall meets and the firebox meet because usually that's fire brick on the inside and on the outside you have regular brick and that splits and you get sparks that go down to cause possible combustion there as well. So there's a lot of different issues. So 70% of the time is, is kind of a, a, a good rule. It's sometimes higher. Okay. So one of the things that you're saying here is somebody looks where their outer hearth, which is a part that projects out in the room and their inner hearth where those two things meet. If they see a small separation right there, you're saying that's a concern. They should be getting that checked out. Am I hearing you correctly? Yes, you are, sir. Okay. So let me ask you this. When there is this problem, what is the repair? What's the fix for this when there is wood discovered? Because a lot of times, this wood is already scorched. So what does a chimney technician do if they find this? How do you fix it, Stephen? How do you take care of that problem? Well, that's a very good question, Jerry, because, you know, in the industry, there's a lot of different, you know, people tend to think they can get inside of that area down below the fireplace and take it out. And there's really no way you can get all of that wood out. And it's very clear in the NFPA 211 that it states any wood you know, underneath is, is is a combustible. You can't have it there, period. So it's very rare you can get all the wood out. So they, they do make some zero clearance 
fireplace units. One of them is Aaron's. It's an Aaron fire, not Aaron's. Aaron fire. Um, it's a zero um, to combustible, so zero inches to combustibles if it's installed to meet all its manufacturer's installation instructions. And the instructions for these are very, very clear. The other one that just came out in the market is, is called a prior fire. That's also another one that we can install to zero inches clearances to combustion. Um, and it's being tested again at, at the labs now to make the, even the floor thicknesses even less from what I'm understanding. There's also one other possibility that you could do. Uh, pellet stoves make a zero inch, a zero clearances combustible box you can put a pellet stove in. That's the only um, solid fuel product I know that you can put in there with a zero clearance box and put the pellet stove in to do it. I don't know of any gas appliances that allow to zero clearance, and I don't know any wood stove inserts that allow to zero clearance either. I've done a tremendous amount of research on all of these things. I haven't found one yet. I just don't know if they are, and I'm not a gas specialist, so. Got you covered. And, you know, one of the things here about these fireplaces, when you talk about the Aaron's fire and you talk about the prior fire, is how are they doing this? Well, there's actually, the way these are designed is they have air that's pulled underneath that lower floor and goes into the back. Now, I recently did a show on here with Chris Pryor and John Meredith, and Chris is kind of like the engineering mind of the industry. I'll say that. You know, oh, yeah. Chris, Chris is, a, Chris is an engineer, and Chris has designed this prior fire where it both survives, it, it suffices to reduce that clearance so that wood can stay there with yep. no problem, but he's also devised a fireplace that is very energy efficient and very clean burning. In fact, you know, it's, te it's passing the emissions test because a lot of times people look at burning wood as being, we'll say, I'm just going to say they look at it as being evil. It creates smog and all this. Yep. But the truth is, whenever you burn wood, if you burn wood properly and efficiently, there's less emissions produced by burning the wood than there is if it simply rots in the forest. So wood burning can be good for the environment. And we want to make sure that everybody understands that. A lot of fireplaces, they don't have these provisions. So that's some of the things you're looking for. Now, Stephen, what about in the flu system? How do you inspect the flu? I mean, we may have a flu that has offsets or crooks in it to it. It may be 20 or 30 foot tall. Now, you're not a little, you're not exactly a small little guy that's going to fit no, down not. in that flu. So, Stephen, tell me how a chimney technician in today's world inspects those flu areas and what are some of the common problems that you would find in this inspection process you're going to talk about? Okay, that's a very good question, Jerry. So, a, a technician that's going to be out in the field is going to use a, a camera system, uh, one of design. There are many different manufacturers out there that have camera systems. I use a chim scan because it's what I like to use. I like the picture quality of it. You know, and like I said, there's a lot of different manufacturers out there. So, what happens is, is you get your camera. I like to set mine down inside the hearth, you know, uh, on the hearth extension so the customer can see it, and I run my camera up. You can also have ways where you can run your camera down. So the camera that we use is called a light, I call it, a, it's a lighthouse camera that was designed specifically to look up inside the chimney. So what I do is I connect this camera up under rods and I put it up inside the flue. It has stabilizer bars on it that keeps it centered in the flue. And then it has an automatic rotation that goes around that I get to set the speed and how fast it goes around. So what I'm doing is when I'm doing my inspection, I have my, my sheet and I'm marking off which tile it is and what I'm looking at. So so if we're looking at the bottom tile, we mark it off at tile one, we go up inside, we take a look at the tile, it goes all the way around, and then I have it pivot up and down to change the angles to see if I'm seeing anything else because the light may be distorting it here or there. So I'm, I'm, I'm having it going up and down, and I'm also having it going all the way around the flue as I go up. And what I'm looking for inside there, are basically I'm looking for either cracks, I'm looking for delamination or spalling as they call it. Um, those are the types of things I'm looking for inside of a flue tile itself. Now, when we get up to the mortar joint, some of the things that I'm looking for is I'm looking to see if we have any protrusion. I'm looking to see if the mortar joint is solid all the way around. I'm looking to see if it, you know, if I can tell if it's a refractory mortar joint, because that's what's supposed to be in there when they build the chimney. So if they're building the chimney without the refractory mortar, most of the time, there are a lot of protrusions inside of there. I'm also looking to see if the tile inside the chimney is shifted over a little bit or this way and the other way. And that's why I like the, the, the pivot up and down. So I can get the camera to go up above it and see if the mortar joint is there or not, if the, if the tile is shifted over. 
And then you get into things with the angles in them, and you have to see how the angles are set up. And you're also looking for the, the cracks and the holes and things of that. And I found so many things inside of chimneys by, by doing this. And you want to carry this camera all the way up because you can never assume what you, what you see down bottom is what you're going to see up top. Very rarely does that ever happen. So you have to take the camera all the way to the top, look at every single mortar joint all the way around, every single tile all the way around, so you know exactly what's going on. And then you get the camera up the top, you can actually see outside. You can actually see the top of the chimney because my camera actually pivots down, so I can see the whole top of the chimney without even getting on the roof. Gotcha. That's good, man. And I'm presuming you have a way of storing these photos digitally and they can be sent to your customer. Am I correct? Yes, there are many different ways depending on the camera system you have. They have an SD card that goes in so you can snap them right there. I also use uh, my iPhone and when I capture it with my iPhone, I'm making sure that I got just the screen. Now on my particular one, I make sure that the date and time stamped on it and I make sure the address and uh, address of where I'm at is on it because if this ever gets brought into a court of law, I have it stamped and address on it so it can't be refuted. And that was uh, kind of very important. I learned that a long time ago in one of your classes. Great. Now, Dave Levitt has asked a very interesting question here. And I'm going to turn this over to you, Stephen, because his question is, what's the difference between Prior Fire and Aaron's? And this is two different companies, two different designs. But what would you give Dave as an answer when he asked you, what is the difference between the Prior Fire and an Aaron's Fire Fireplace? Okay, so an Aaron Fire Fireplace is a refractory um, formed fireplace units. What they do is they have a back wall, two side walls, another two side walls, a floor, um, and what they have what they have going on is they have a bunch of different pieces go together, and they're very heavy units, and they're all refractory. You have to take the firebox out like you do with anything else on either one. So it's a very heavy unit, and usually it takes about two usually two to three days. Some guys can do it in a day. I like to take two to three days um, to do them, but they're very heavy pieces that you're putting in. The two and a half inches worth of refractory, and you have to cut some of the pieces that you're putting in. The the air, uh, the prior fire is really unique. It has basically um, a, a stand that you put all the pieces together, and these fire bricks that you get, okay, these fire bricks are actually sent over from from Europe, I believe Germany, from what uh, Chris told me, and they're all cut to particular sizes, and then you basically you put them all together, particular place, particular sizes, and, hey, and you put them all in. And this prior fire can be put in in one hour. It goes in, it's one hour, you got it all done, and it, it, it still has the airflow that goes through it. The difference between them, like with the prior fire, it actually has the air in the back. You put no mortar in the back wall of that prior fire, and on the prior fire on the side walls, you only putting in fire clay that they give you and that's only for the fascia wall so if you have to do a repair later you can you just tap the fire clay out and replace the brick and you're done it's such a unique system i, I was blown away by the engineering that chris and john have put into this it just it, it blew me away right now if you also look on the stream my friend ziggy godowski i hope i pronounced his name right but it's ziggy he's out in vancouver washington and he works with the canadians uh, very big. He's involved with the Canadian industry out there, but he's made a statement here about check out the Firecast fireplace as well. It's certified as a UL 127 zero clearance fireplace as a full chimney repair system to zero clearance. So let's don't leave that one out, Stephen. Do you know oh, much absolutely. about? Do you know much about the Firecast system? No, no, I don't. It's just been recently sent out to me. I've actually, I believe Ziggy or somebody from the company has recently sent me some inf information about the Firecast. And to be honest, I haven't had the time to look in it because I've been involved with all of my different things with the National Chimney Sweep Guild with our conventions and expos and things. Okay. So, but you would recognize that also as a viable part if it's a listed product. And I don't think Ziggy would be telling us anything wrong. Do you agree? So, and then Dave Levis just had said, I attended a class on prior fire, but never in Aaron's. That's why I asked. Thanks, Stephen. So that's from Dave Levitt, who's a friend of both of ours up there. And, you know, I don't think Dave's very far from you, is he? No, he's not. Dave is about a half an hour south of me, and we have talked. Um, and we, um, you know, he wants to see a, uh, an Aaron fire go in because I do install probably six to 10 of these a year. And you know, he's going to come out to one of my, when yeah. I do an install, so he can take a look at it. 
Yeah, and Ziggy just put up, he wasn't him that sent that to you. He doesn't sell anything, and he was passing along his information because Ziggy is an educator in uh, Canada. Ziggy attends a lot of my classes, so he's coming in from an opinion offered right there. He's not a sales rep for Firecast, and neither myself or Stephen are either paid by Aaron's or for Prior Fire. Nope. But what we're making here, we're just trying to pass the information along. And this is where, realistically, if this work needs to be done, Stephen, they need to get a qualified contractor to offer the best solution for that fireplace. Would you agree with that assessment? Absolutely. You want somebody that knows what they're doing coming into your, your house to be able to assess it properly and to know what needs, what, what can go in there because it's not a one size fits all. You know, the, the prior fire can only be a certain size fireplace right now. They are testing for a bigger one and same with the errands. You, you know, you, they're not, they don't all fit inside. So you have to make sure your measurements, you have to know what you're doing with it. I recommend you get some training for it. There's plenty of training out there to put these things in. Um, but yeah, and same with the fire cast, it's the no. same thing. It's learning the product and being qualified to do it. Right. So again, we're speaking to consumers. So what this means is if you're a consumer and you're watching this, hopefully what you need to do is get a, is get a technician that you feel trust in that can explain to you and offer you the best solution for your fireplace. Would you agree with that advice, Stephen? Absolutely. Okay. So Stephen, I'm going to ask you another question. In my opinion, one of the mo the hardest challenges that a masonry chimney has to undergo is being subjected to water entry issues, freeze thaw, all those type of things. So would you agree with that, that water entry is a very corrosive matter to masonry materials in the chimney environment? It is the worst thing for a masonry chimney in, in the environment. Water does the most amount of damage than anything else inside the chimney. You can have a chimney fire and that's just going to crack the tiles or partially the chimney, but the water intrusion inside of your chimney is going to cause more damage than anything else. Right. And that's, and that's a common issue. One, one of the things that I like to do on this show is advise customers what to look for to signify if they have trouble. So one of the things I always tell them is, if you look up at the top of your chimney, which most consumers don't look at the top of chimneys like you and I do if we're riding down the road, yep. but walk out in your, in, your, in your lawn, walk out in your yard where you can see your chimney. Now, as you look towards your chimney up in the air, towards the top of it, it should have what we call an overhanging crown. And this is where the concrete, and when we say a crown, that's the concrete material that's on top of the chimney. And it should be overhanging that chimney on all four sides, kind of like an umbrella, so the water doesn't run right down the chimney, and rather it's running off the chimney. Would you agree with that advice, Stephen? Absolutely, Jerry. The crown is a very important part of the chimney. It should overhang two inches, minimum two inches thick. It should have a little bond break on it. You should be able to lift the crown off the chimney. There's always there's certain things about a crown that's supposed to be able to do it. You know, it's supposed to have a bond break going around the tile so the tile can expand and contract. Um, and underneath the crown, you're supposed to have a little uh, indentation going around it so no water can creep in and underneath it. A lot of these things, you, you know, you've missed. That's, that's just part of our inspection. Right. So again, like I say, I like to advise clients or customers or consumers who are listening to this show on the things to look for. Yes, they should have their chimneys inspected on an annual basis. We would all agree on that. But I also like to provide them things to look at on their chimney they can see from the ground. So one of them is if they look at their fireplace and above the fireplace, fireplace, Stephen, we yeah. see soot stains, we see smoke stains. What is that telling us if we see that? And is that a bad thing? Well, it is telling us a lot of different things. It's telling us to look further uh, from an inspection point of view, because there's a lot of reasons you could have a smoke stain in front of, in front of on your facial wall of your fireplace. One of them can be that the damper is not eight inches above where, the, where it goes in. We call that the throat area. It's supposed to be eight inches. If it's lower than that, it can cause turbulence. Okay, things like that. If your flue tiles aren't the right size for the opening of the firebox, because it's supposed to be a certain ratio going up and through. And that's why a complete inspection is, is important. So that way there you can know if the fireplace is the right size for that. If your smoke chamber is not parched, okay, if your smoke chamber is too big or too small, 
All of, a lot of these different reasons can be reasons you haven't smoked, but there's also other reasons that may not be chimney related. It may be house related, like different pressure issues going on inside the house. And this is why I say a good inspection. You're looking at the chimney, but you're also looking at the whole house. You're looking at everything. Yeah. And Ron Russ has put in there and he's made a very valid point. We need something where it gives us that drip edge. And as Ron Russ has pointed out, an outside mount chimney top with a lid having an overhang could serve as well as correct crown work. And he's exactly right. In fact, back about 10 years ago, Stephen, I actually invented a process that was taken up by a company called White Caps, and it pretty well went through the other chimney cap manufacturers. Owens Nexel now, they call them the chimney helmet. But in the chimney cap I designed back then, it was actually called the big dripper. So what we did was we, met, we, we matched the look and the function of the overhanging crown with the chimney cap itself where it was overhanging because putting, pouring crowns is a really hard job. Plus in the winter time, it may be too cold or whatever. So yes, there's viable options, but let's take it a little further. As we go into this, Stephen, one of the things that I tell consumers, if I was speaking to a group of consumers or I was speaking to home inspectors that I do a lot of training with, one of the things I share with them is to look at the chimney exterior and see if they see white staining or black staining or moss growing or those type of things. Would you agree with that advice and would you reinforce that to anyone listening? Yes, yes, I would. And, you know, you want to basically step back from your chimney, like you said, for all the homeowners, step back from your chimney and take a good look at it. I like to refer to like Columbo. Just one more thing. You want to look at everything with, with, with um, a new set of eyes and not assume anything. You know, if you've got white stain, it may be coming from the efflorescence or the salts that are coming out that it's bleeding out because of the excessive, excessive moisture. It may be algae. It may be moss. Okay, there may be the black staining that's coming out. There may be some rust stain that's coming out somewhere because there's metal inside there. Uh, there's a lot of different things, but the efflorescence doesn't necessarily mean it's moisture. It could be a heating system problem or a flu problem. And that's why you need to really have somebody to investigate it further to find out what those stains mean. But step back from your chimney and look at it and find out where the patterns are and find out like which way the sun is going, which way your winds are going. You know, I, I, I write down in all my reports, you know, what the weather pattern is that day when I go out there because I want to know, you know when they call me later that there's still a problem. Yeah. So, Stephen, let's look at another type of plants. And a lot of consumers may not even know this, but many times we're going to have a system that's going to heat our home. It could be a furnace or it could be a boiler. You may pronounce boiler differently from me, I but know. it might be one of those things. Or it could be the domestic water heater that heats it. These are fueled by natural gas or by fuel oil that you'll probably pronounce differently also than me. Yep. But okay. But anyway, what you know, what are the problems that you commonly find when we have central heating systems or water heating systems and they're vented into chimneys? What's the common issues that you run into? Okay, the common problems that I'm running into in these systems is one, they're not getting them swept out prior to them getting changed out, which is in the NFPA 211. Anytime there's an appliance that, that is changed, you must get your chimney swept. It states it in there. So what's one of the problems? So what happens is they're putting this new higher efficiency unit that goes inside of this unit, which tends to condensate inside there. So if you have oil soot that was from a 76% efficient unit, and now you're putting an 87% efficient unit, all it's going to do is turn into acid inside the chimney and cause it to spall and fall down or delaminate. So the pieces of tile are falling down and the mortar falls out and things start to shift and crack and break. These all happen inside the chimney, so it's causing moisture. And sometimes you can actually see it if you have an outside chimney, you can see that the same way. A lot of also times what's going on is they're either undersizing the appliance inside the chimney because they're putting in a little four inch vent inside the chimney and they got an eight by 12 flue. And so now all it's going to do is condensate because it doesn't have enough stack temperature because it's too efficient. So and these are a lot of different things that they really need to pay attention to, especially like with the oil. I have just been uh, appointed to the NFPA 31 committee, another hat that I wear. So oil is definitely my wheelhouse. Um, and it has been, I've done a lot of research on uh, oil fired appliances and what they do inside of chimneys. Um, and, you know, we need to really, as an industry, start insulating all of these appliances because, it, you know, that's one of the changes I would like to make in, on the NPA 31 committee because 
it's they're just causing too much problems in the inside of the chimney and if you got that you're going to end up having carbon monoxide possible issues inside the home and so that's why i say good inspection is a necessity right so you know when we look at this uh, you know not fuel oil appliances and you if you need to repeat that in your northern language feel free when we say when i say fuel oil but fuel oil appliances have gotten much more efficient in the last few years and you're in what i call oil country oil yeah. is really big in the northeastern united states there's not a lot of natural gas run in some areas and yeah. propane's really expensive so fuel oil is the is the fuel of choice so how much has the efficiency rose on these appliances and what's the problem as you as the efficiency rises what does this do to the combustion products that go into the chimney that's a great question jerry because over the past i'm going to say 15 years or 20 years actually the uh the industry has on the fuel oil industry has come and they raised their standards from about 76 to 78 percent as a normal combustion whether it was a boiler or whether it's a furnace. And now most of the combustion that's going in the fuel oil boilers and furnaces uh, are 86, 87, 88%. The, the Wiesmann uh, boilers, which came over from Germany, they started importing them about 20 years ago. They put up to 12 gallons of water in condensation alone inside of a chimney that's 30 degrees or less in a house a day. Their stack temperature are, are, are max. 250 degrees. The Baderas boiler is the same thing. They're running 87% and their, their stack temperatures are basically 250 after the barometric. So when it hits the chimney and everything condensates at 136 and you get zero degrees outside, everything is condensating. So all that's doing is it's changing everything to acid. It's eating up the inside of the tile because the tile is made of clay. It's um, it's a vitreous clay liner, so and it's not used to handle those type of acids and it delaminates naturally because the tile can't handle it. Gotcha. So today's world, you know, a lot of people associate chimney lining with safety, but there's a lot more reasons to line a chimney than safety. The reasons, as you're explaining right now, are to keep the chimney from falling apart and also to keep the appliance operating properly. Because if we have an oversized masonry chimney, we're going to make more condensation and this is going to be a very acidic mix that can attack the brick. And you, <laughs> you talked about something a while ago, you said delamination. And there's another term we use, which is spalling. Would you explain what those two words mean, Stephen? They, well, they virtually, to me, they mean the same thing. So delamination is when the tile itself, is, it's, it's a vitreous clay liner, which means it's glass-like. So it means that what happens is water gets in behind it and a little piece falls off and another little piece falls off and another little piece falls off. And in, in where I live up here in the Northeast, the cold, the cold outside will also have a factor in it because it'll make it happen quicker because the inside temperatures and the outside temperatures are too different. So it'll happen. Now, spalling is basically the same thing. So it's basically pieces of tile falling on, you know, off off the side of the tiles, making the tiles thinner and thinner. Once a tile starts to spall, that glass-like that, that has on the inside is now gone. It can no longer handle the products of combustion because what's happening now is that that first part of the tile delaminates, its condensation is getting in and, and getting through. So if you're looking, stepping back from your chimney and your chimney is 25 years old and you're looking at it and you've got a white line coming down one side, you know, basically the top eight, 10 feet, you can pretty much guess if you got some issues going on with either delamination um, or condensation or both in that chimney. Okay. Now, another thing, Stephen, is, and we see this a lot in inspections, do you see much mortar between the flue tiles missing? So everybody will understand, flue tiles installed in sections, and they're terracotta clay, vitreous clay, just like Stephen said. And they may be 12-inch lengths, and they may be 24. I would say 24 is much more common. But between each of those, they've got to be joined with a mortar. So common... So, Stephen, whenever you do inspections, do you commonly see that that mortar between the flue tiles is gone in the chimneys? Most of the time, that's one of the things that we see, the mortar, because when you join, when you build a, a chimney, I, I have built a lot of chimneys, it's one of my fortes, you're supposed to join your clay tile, okay, with refractory mortar, because it, it expands and contracts the same amount, okay, 
just like the clay tile does when it's heated up. So when you don't, when you use regular mortar, what happens inside of there is it doesn't expand and contract at the same rate as the clay tile does. So it tends to chip out and what have you. And then you add water to it, which makes it worse because it's basically sand, lime, and, and, and Portland are just going to fall apart. So yeah, I see a lot of that happening where the, the, the mortar joints just fall out. Okay, so good. So what we're talking about here, we've really not even dealt with metal chimneys, factory built chimneys. We're staying in the masonry side and that's one of Stephen's expertise is like I said, he builds chimneys. So he takes them down, rebuilds them, relines them, does a lot of different work like that. So let me ask you about a different type of appliance, Stephen, and that would be a wood stove. What are the problems that you commonly see from a wood stove that's installed into a masonry chimney? What does a chimney sweep find that's a problem with wood stoves? Well, most of the time when I'm looking at a wood stove, you know, I walk in and I do the inspection. The first thing I'm checking is the clearance to combustibles. I want to know the name of the stove. I want to get the plate off the back of it. I want to know the clearances to make sure all that, because a lot of times the clearances aren't good. But one of the biggest problems that I see is the pipes are upside down because, the you know, the, they get, it's supposed to be male ends down on any solid fuel. I see that a lot. And then they go into the thimble wall, into the wall into the thimble, and usually what happens is they go into the, a larger side and they don't have a proper thimble going through the wall because it's supposed to be a masonry thimble and you're supposed to have 12 inches of masonry all around it. Most of the time, they're going through a block wall and you got studs right next to it. So they get an improper wall pass through connecting up to the flue tiles. And then it goes into the flue tiles. And most of the time, it's outside. You get a six inch pipe going into an eight by 12 flue. So it's undersized by code. It needs a stainless steel liner because now the flue gases are going through and they're going out and expanding and condensing, causing creosote possible chimney fires down the road because you can't possibly burn it hot, hot enough in this climate that we live in. Those are most of the problems. Got you covered there. So a lot of times what we've got to do is for the performance and also for the safety to keep creosote from forming those type of things. Many times does a masonry chimney need to be relined for a wood stove? Yes. As a matter of fact, it states in the NFPA 211, if you're more than two times uh, the, the square inch ratio of the six inch round pipe going in, which is most of the stoves today, you know, most of the flue tiles are eight by 12s. It's required that you have a stainless steel insulated liner. Um, the, the liner manufacturer requires that you have insulation on it to meet the UL listing and code, com the code compliance states that you have to have it follow the UL, the manufacturer's installation instructions. Gotcha. So lining chimneys and, you know, me and you go back many, many years ago. And if we look at the early eighties, there wasn't much concentration on this inventing systems. I mean, commonly in a lot of stuff that we did back in those days, it's a different world today than it was when you went to work for your aunt Leslie and your uncle oh, yeah. Bill. Oh yeah. It was completely different back then. We were just trying to figure out how to sweep the chimney, how to get the creosote out, you know, trying to figure out different ways of doing things. We were making our own tools and a good friend of ours, Pete Lourdes came up with a whole bunch of different tools to help us get rid of creosote and the chains and whatever. We were trying to figure it all out that we didn't know. And they're making these stoves so airtight. I remember looking in the Vermont castings, uh, stove manual back then and it says close it all down so it slow burns so you can get the most amount of your wood which we know you know causes all kinds of creosote so it's like you know that was the manual so i'm sitting there like burn the manual let's get this stove going yeah there's another friend of ours just came on watch that james owen said hello guys so james you know james and james yep. is right down the road for me james is a client of mine that actually was a competitor of mine for a number of years before i went into coaching and consulting so yeah. hey it's a small world out here so james good to see you on here tonight so Stephen, we've covered a lot of areas tonight and we're trying to bring up the importance of having chimneys checked having them inspected how to keep your chimney healthy and happy because a while ago we talked about it if the chimney is performing properly and we're and we're going to have less pollutants in the atmosphere and a lot of consumers today they're concerned about that which yeah. is the greenhouse effect and other things. Yeah. So we want to pass this along, you know, what you want, if you have a chimney passing through your home, you want it being happy. And when I say happy, you want it performing well. Think of it this way. If you got a chimney and the smoke's not going up, that chimney's frowning. It's not happy, is it, Stephen? It's not happy. Neither is the homeowner. No. Nobody's happy. So a lot of times somebody, I've heard consumers say this, you know, I love to smell the wood burn in my fireplace. I love to smell the burning wood. And one of the things that I'll share with them at that point is, you know, I hate to tell you this, 
but what you're smelling could kill you prematurely. This could have a long-term health effect. So Stephen, if somebody is using their fireplace, using their wood stove, and every time they use it, they get to smell the smoke in their house, even though they may enjoy it. Is that kind of a dangerous signal? They need to get a chimney sweep to check this out? Yeah, yeah, they should get a chimney professional allowed to come out and take a look at this. Because one of the things that can happen is, especially because the houses have gotten so tight um, that the, there's what they call a pressure differential going on in some of the houses where, you know, the change of pressure can change whether the smoke comes down the chimney or goes up the chimney. You know, and it's, it's, it's really, it's gotten a lot tighter over the years. I remember, I think it was in your class that I learned this, that Benjamin, Tom, uh, Benjamin Franklin, okay, and, and Thompson, who was Count Rumford, sat down and talked about pressure problems back then in the late 1700s and early 1800s, and look where we are now. We got so, the houses are so tight now, if you turn on the dryer, it pulls air out. You got recessed lighting, it pulls air out. You know, so the houses, the ridge vents, pulling the air out, it's coming down the chimney. Yeah, just I don't know if you remember this, but you were in a class that I taught some years ago at Old Sturbridge Village yeah. in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. And it was really funny because they had the stink in this chimney in that place. And it's yep. like, good God almighty, we got to, you know, we got a class going on in this chimney that you can't, that even the smell of that creosote was bothering a bunch of us. And there's another one of our friends saying, hello, Julie Dent there is joining us tonight also. Julie, appreciate you being on here with us tonight. So, but down south, let me ask you if you have this, this problem in New Hampshire. Down south where James Owens is there and also where Julie Dent is, we have a really bad problem with stinky chimneys in the summertime because what's happening is we have a lot of air being pulled down the chimney yes. because of pressure issues and because of air conditioning that the, and all kinds of different things go on. It's a real science. Yes. Is stinky chimneys a problem in New Hampshire? Yes, it is. Uh, ours is mainly the other way because it's, everything is so tight because they've tightened up the house. So what happens is, the chimney itself, if it's not being used, the air comes down the chimney and goes out the house because you know they got everything else. The windows are tight. They don't realize if they need to change the pressure planes inside inside the building in order to alleviate the problem to cause the, the draft to go up. You know, heat naturally rises. So if you got like like you have down south, you have the uh, attic fans. Okay, right. so you have the place for the attic fans. So that's a place where all the air is going to go. So it's naturally up here, we have what they call the drop downs to get into your attic and they're not sealed. And then we have the attic vents. So they're venting naturally. So air is being pulled up through the house. So it's the same thing. It's just, you know, right. It's well, that's, a problem. Right. That's one of the things that we trained a lot of chimney sweeps. And I did a class a couple of weeks ago on venting issues, pressure issues, understanding that from barometric issues. Like I said, the reason I asked that you're in a much colder climate, it's like it gets a lot hotter down here in the summertime. And so you'll know we don't have a lot of people with attic fans anymore. About everybody's got central heat, central air down here. Attic fans in the 60s, yeah, but you don't run into many attic fans in the South now. Most of us have modernized our houses and we got air conditioning in them now, but it does cause pressure issues. Yeah. You've, tight, you've tightened up your house, you know? Okay. So, Stephen, let's say we got a consumer listening to us. And this consumer saying, okay, I need to get a company to come out here and check this out. One of the first things I'm going to advise, and I need to know if you agree with this, but I believe that company should be a member of the National Chimney Sweep Guild. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. He should be a member of the National Chimney Sweep Guild. He should be taking classes. He should be learning all the different things. He should be certified. Um, absolutely. Okay. So that's what I mean. So, and this is different way, different areas of the country. You can pretty find some pretty well find someone that can assist you, but you know, different, you know, what, what you've got to do, I always encourage them check the reviews on Google. Would you yep. agree with that? Now check all the reviews, the, the Google and the Facebook. Facebook is actually getting more hits now than Google is. Okay. So before we end this broadcast, is there anything else you would share with our listeners about chimneys and fireplaces and how to keep them healthy and happy? Get a professional chimney sweep to come out that's certified and do a complete inspection. Okay. Know, know what's going on. Okay. And then, like I said, how often should it, let's, let's remind them of this. Yeah. The National Fire Protection Association, which is not chimney sweeps, that is fire chiefs, fire inspectors, insurance officials, 
What do they advise about having a chimney checked, Stephen? You're supposed to have your chimney checked once a year. Okay. That's the and, NFPA 211. Correct. And that's the thing about our industry. We actually have standard of care, which is classified as a level one, a level two, or a level three. This is spelled out in the National Fire Protection Association 211 standards. Yep. A little earlier, you said that you had been, you had just been appointed to the 31 committee. Let's yep. go into that. What it, What is 31 a part of? Why don't you tell folks a little bit about that? Because Stephen, that's a pretty high honor and that means people really believe in your ability. So you need to really be feel really good about that. But what does 31 mean, Stephen? Well, thank you, Jerry. Uh, the NFPA 31 is the oil code. Uh, basically what it is, it's the, um, the installation of all oil burning equipment, how it gets put in the oil lines, um, the oil tanks, all of these different things, the appliances, the venting, all of it. It goes into the NFPA 31. And so I'm going to be sitting, I am sitting chair now for the National Chimney Sweep Guild for the NFPA 31 so I can put my input into, you know, making maybe some changes or not changes or helping with the, with the code and the standard for heating oil appliances for the country. Okay. That's, you know, that's a huge honor. Okay. So Stephen, I got a st question for Stephen. These positions and the work that you're doing, it don't pay real good, does it? Okay. So Simple. you're doing, you're doing this as a volunteer. Yes. Tell me why. Because I want to give back to everybody. I want to give back to what this industry has given to me. Uh, that comes from my heart. Um, I have gotten so much from this industry and the people in this industry and the amount that we had to fight back in the 70s and the 80s to get all of this information. And now that we have gotten um, into these committees and doing these different things, I want to share this information with everybody so they don't have to go through all the different things that I went through trying to test this and trying to try that and trying to do this. I want to give back and teach back to everybody. You know, <clears throat> I'm an open book. Okay. Well, that's great, man. Steven, I'm really proud of you. I'm seeing in the last few years, I'm seeing you're coming on, you're, you're assuming the leadership position. You're doing a lot of training. You're helping other people. You're sharing your knowledge, but this is the other thing. I know that you're still open to learning. You're a person that knows you don't know it all yet. You know what I'm saying? Nope, I don't know it all. And that's the thing. I still go to classes. I, I go I go to CBC and I learn things. I go online. I go to classes. I teach classes. The biggest thing, and you'll know this too, Jerry, when you're teaching a class, you're also learning. Yes, you, you know? are. And that's that's the biggest gift. You know, you, you're learning all kinds of things by doing that. I, it's an amazing, amazing thing. So I'll, I'll, ne I'll never stop learning. Okay. Well, brother, I want to appreciate you being on here tonight. Like I said, we do this as a public service. We don't look for sponsorship from anyone else. We do this through our company, CBC Success Group. So if we can help you at CBC Success Group, feel free to reach out to us. We appreciate you listening in here. Dave Levitt just said, that's a good one right there. Dave Levitt just added in. Thanks guys. Great subject tonight, Dave. We really appreciate that. So yeah, if you're watching this, feel free to share this on your own social media. We do this to help the people in this industry get the word out to the industry. Okay. We, that's what we're trying to do. And that's, that's our purpose here and why we do this completely as we do. So appreciate you being there. There's another gentleman that just tuned in. His name is Jay Walker. Yeah, you can go ahead. So what I'd like to say about that, I was once that employee back 20, 15, 20 years ago, and Jerry don't know that. I had that head. I thought I knew it all. Guess what? I learned that I didn't. And I that happened to me twice, that I thought I knew it all. Now that I know that I'll never know it all, it's a huge thing. So thank you for putting that up, Jay. Well, one of the things about Jay, Jay, that's kind of a private message because I know the employee he's talking about. And we're just... <laughs> Jay, you and I are going to leave it at that tonight. But yeah, Jay did have a uh, boy that was one of my students one time. He thought he knew it all and, you know, kind of came back to haunt him with later. And if you look there, if you look right there, he just gave us a thumbs up. So when he read, when he put that in, Stephen, I knew exactly who he was talking about right and that's there. that's okay. I just wanted to address it because for me, I, everybody gets to the point where they think they know it all in the industry. And all I can say is open up your eyes, be Columbo, and look at it with a brand new set of eyes. We will never know it all. We will yeah. never know it all.
Yeah, and Jay just put up another one about a dear departed friend that we both know, Mr. Jack Pixley, because Jack passed away a few years ago. I was able to give Jack Pixley the first uh, Lifetime Achievement Award when I was president of the National Guild, but that's what Jack always signed his emails with, always learning. And if you looked at the National Convention, Jack was always out there in the crowd. I can well remember. And Jack's one of those unique individuals that's helped build this industry. You said something earlier about another friend of ours, and there's a lot more, Mr. Pete Luter, which goes back. And you know that he and I were very close, had a very close relationship. Yep. So, Stephen, I appreciate you being here very, very much tonight. I think we've shared some great knowledge with the people. And again, if you're watching this, keep in mind, the purpose of this show is not to promote my company. Stephen did come on here tonight to promote his company. He's on here tonight. And what we're trying to do is share great information with the consumers across America. And with that, we'll see you next time. My name is Jerry Eisenhower, and I sincerely do appreciate you joining us on tonight's broadcast of the Fireplace Show. Talk to you later.